have, I think we have a really big consumption problem in the world. Um, I think mm. is in general, I think, you know, you can talk about sustainability and, and even how you produce products, but ultimately I think we just, as, as humans, I think we just probably consume more than we ultimately need in a lot of cases. Absolutely. And, yeah. and, and so I think it comes down to, you know, how do you find ways to make better products, but also make them so that they're longer lasting. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, also think about what's the end of life strategy of a product. And so those are all things that, you know, really taking into a lot of consideration, um, especially as you know, there's been a, you know, people were spending more money or time in their homes and thinking about, you know, what, what that looks like. Um, so we really started trying to kind of solve that problem at model number um, at looking at furniture, not only in the homes, but then as you start to think, you know, as uh, you know, we were kind of coming out of the pandemic of like, you know, what does the workplace look like? Um, you know, people spending more time traveling and, and spending more money on experiences, maybe rather than you know, consumption of material goods. Um, what does hospitality look like? And what are the things that we can be doing, you know, from a, uh, on the furniture side to really impact that? And so um, out of that has come, you know, model number. Um, we 3D print and digitally fabricate furniture. Um, we, we, produce everything locally to the markets that we're in. So today, you know, we're only, um, we only ship products you know, primarily to the United States uh, or US-based companies that maybe have offices um, globally. Um, and we source all of our materials or 95% of our materials are sourced locally. Um, we, you know, use only sustainable uh, materials uh, uh, as well as eco-friendly and non-toxic um, materials in, in what we do. So. In when we 3D print, um, we use uh, uh, we're using plant-based, you know, agricultural waste, um, and uh, anything that we you know, digitally fabricate with wood, it's either sustainably farmed or it's reclaimed and salvaged wood. And what about the social responsibility? Do you feel like um, you treat people differently? You treat suppliers differently? You have different working relationships? Uh, how would you describe that? Yeah, I mean, I've always operated that way. I mean, for me, um, you know, we've got really, I would say, very strong relationships with our vendors. Um, you know, if you look at it, even just, I think, from a social responsibility internally, you know, one of the reasons that we don't use toxic materials, it, it's one, obviously, not wanting to put you know, more of those toxic elements out into the market. But for example, we don't use recycled plastics. Um, we use raw, like I said, plant resin and agricultural waste because they don't have toxins. They don't have, they don't have petroleum based chemicals in them. And so you have to think about your employees. So if they're manufacturing things, we don't have large filtration systems and things because we don't need them because we're not using, you know, hazardous materials. So we also think about like, you know, what are our people being exposed to um, in, you know, in our micro factories when we're, when we're producing things. So we really try to kind of think about the whole supply chain. Um, And similarly, I mean, it's, you know, for us, for me, like I, I there, when you're running a business, right, you, you, you're, you're trying to generate revenue, you need to be, you know, profitable for the long term kind of health of, of the company and to be able to fulfill your mission. But at the same time, you know, I think we're very transparent in, in our cost, the things that we're doing, um, and, you know, working so that, uh, you know, with our vendors, uh, that, you know, I think everyone feels, I think you're know, very comfortable um, is, you know, the, how we operate our business and the exposure that, you know, that they have to it. So. We're talking about overconsumptions. You mentioned this already as well. How do you deal with that as well? Because there is this kind of ambiguity. Yes, you're doing business more in an environmental friendly way, but we are all still doing business. Uh, so how do you deal with that to not, to, you, you need to grow, right, as well at, this, uh, at the same point in time. Uh, you don't want, you think that overconsumption might not be good either. How do you deal with that? One of the things that we're working on and we're going to be rolling out later this year is what we call a take back program. Um, and so we're going to uh, offer, you know, our business is broken down. So we, we work, um, we do have a direct to consumer business, you know, for um, in the residential sector, but a lot of our business is, is really focused also on the enterprise um, sector, right? So we, like I said, we work in with companies who, uh, Or as they're reimagining kind of what the workplace and their offices look like, what hospitality, you know, hotels, um, outdoor retail environments. 
we're doing even some stuff in, um, we've got some projects potentially in the healthcare space, um, as well as even in higher education. And as we start to think about, we're working with these, with these, a lot of it, primarily it's the companies, um, but to some you know, lesser extent, even on the residential side, we've been saying to people like, let's build um, a take back program. So when there is an end of life, rather than you, you know, throwing it out in the street corner, throwing it in your, in your dumpster that's gonna end up you know, in, in landfill, like what does that look like? So because all of our materials are either, can be either recycled, composted or naturally biodegrade, um, we have a, we've just produced a chair um, using a new material called cellular acetate, which is 100% biodegradable. So, you know, and there's different, there's different ways that it can biodegrade, you know, like you can submerge it in water, you can be, you can put it in soil, you know, it, different things will take different times. But the idea is we're working on um, an afterlife kind of um, plan for products. So that is, I think, something different. So in the fact that you, even though you're consuming something, it's like, what, what is, we, we want to make sure that it's not just, hey, we're going to manufacture this. It's on you. No, like, let's work together and build a plan so that if when you're done with it, let us know and we can come back and we'll either, you know, in some cases, we'll just recycle it because maybe it's two chairs and it's it's a far away and it doesn't make sense for us to ship it back. It's also thinking about, you know, because shipping and, and the movement of product and goods also, you know, has a huge carbon, um, uh, leaves a car huge carbon footprint. So we're thinking about what that um, you know, the life cycle of a product is and, and how you can properly end it. Mm -hmm. And what about repairing? You said you wouldn't ship uh, back those two chairs, like Patagonia. I visited them. They visited them also eight years ago, the headquarter in Ventura. And at that point in time, already they had those repair buses. I quite like this idea where they were driving all across the U.S. And you know, when people were bringing their Patagonia stuff and so on, they were just repairing it for free. I, I thought that was also a great idea. Yeah, I think, you know, for us, um, you know, I think we'll, we're, we'll take all of that stuff into consideration, um, you know, right now, um, you know, we're still fairly young as a, as a company. Um, and I think, you know, repairing a piece of furniture uh, you know, versus, you know, patching up a jacket is, is, you know, I think a little bit different. So I think we have to kind of figure out exactly, you know, how, what are the logistics on that? You know, what does that look like? Um, uh, you know, I think, I don't have a plan for that yet, um, but it's definitely something I think you know worth looking into for sure. Are there any plans to come to Europe? Eventually, yeah. I mean, you know, for right now, we're trying to work through. Um, you know, we want to expand and probably open up a couple of more uh, what we call micro factories. So the good thing about what we do is it doesn't it doesn't require a lot of space um, because we don't hold any inventory. We don't have distribution centers. It really mm -hmm. comes down to um sourcing material being able to do it like i said kind of locally finding the right vendors um to be able to do that um i've spent a lot of time in europe i was you know there this last summer i'll be there again this this summer and you know i met with a couple of different people um you know, across the eu and and um in the nordics um so there's a lot of emphasis in, on 3d printing you know who, who i think much more um, unique designs that you're, you see, I think, in the marketplace. Two, uh, there is, a, I think, a, a broader sense of, um, I think, both ESG as well as, you know, sustainability in, in, um, in manufacturing. And so, you know, what I've talked to is I've talked to various, you know, different people in, in different countries who have, you know, said, you know, put your, put your next micro factory here. You know, we not only have, we're changing from, you know, what was maybe traditionally, um, uh, you know, a manufacturing processes, we're moving into more like green manufacturing, you know, we want, to, we have the infrastructure here, we actually have the labor here, we have high unemployment, we want to be able to train individuals and, and, and think about, you know, what is that, um, you know, new ways of manufacturing, we have with the local, um, we have a lot of the natural resources here and the things that, you know, that you could use. Um, and in our vendor, we have a couple of our vendors actually um, are headquartered in in, um, in Europe as well. So we have a lot of easy access to all the things we need to do business. I think for me, it's just making sure that we can 
feel comfortable that we've built a scalable model here in the United States first, and then you know we'll start to look to, to build that infrastructure probably in Europe. So um, in the coming years, but uh, definitely it's a goal of mine to uh, to bring you know uh, model number to Europe. Euro the European legislation at the moment is getting uh, a very strong on ESG, which is great actually, I think, uh, but it puts also a burden on companies. Uh, at the same point in time, we have in place since uh, January the supply chain law in, in Germany, which has a huge influence actually on the whole of Europe, where, where companies, you know, they really need to take care of their whole supply chain. They cannot just say like, you know, we take care of what we do within our company. They have to really take care of also of where they supply their stuff. And, and look into this as well, that there isn't any sort of kids' labor or, or any any um, pollution and so on. How is actually the legislation and, and also maybe the society in, in, in the US at the moment? What do you realize there? Yeah, it's, it's, it's very delicate and um, challenging, I think, in the United States um, for a variety of reasons. You know, one, um, I think ESG, I think the terminology is very broad. Right, as, as you you kind of mentioned, I mean, you've got environmental aspects of it, but then you also have social aspects of it. And so I think you know sometimes it gets all lumped in together. Um, and you know, in the United States, we have over 300 million people um, over a large geography who have different kind of political um, <laughs> uh, differences in, in in a lot of ways. And so I think there's been push, I think, at the federal level um, in the United States um, on. Some ESG things, um, but there's a, there's a lot of difference of opinions on on in a lot of areas, and so you see pushback from certain um, states on on things. But I do feel like, generally speaking, you start to see a movement um, where businesses are taking the lead, and I, I find this off, more often than not that you find that businesses lead the way sometimes before government does, at least in the United States, mm -hmm. um, where there's an opportunity, people start to move. And you, you start to see shifts, um, you know, while, I mean, if you look at, you know, electric vehicles, I mean, they have, there's a lot of issues and they're starting to kind of come up with, you know, some of the batteries and things, but I mean, I think they're, they're a better alternative um, than probably gas, but not, but still not the best alternative. You know, I think we, um, I was talking to, I heard somebody speak the other day and said, you know, people keep arguing over, you um, you know, whether you should have a gas co powered car or an electric car, which is better for the environment. And he said, either, no, actually neither one of them is better for the environment. Like getting on a bicycle or walking is actually the best thing for the environment. <laughs> like, you know, like, you know, yeah. you know, like let's build communities where you can actually walk and don't actually, and, or get on a bike or, or something where you don't actually want to have to like deal with a car at all. But so I think, you know, in the United States, there's, there's definitely movement there more, I think I would say, from from businesses as there's a lot of pushback I think um, and a lot of you know politics at play and I think that that we'll continue to see businesses being very proactive and trying to drive um, I think a lot of change and and I hope um, that that that's kind of what you know, moves things forward for us. Uh, in my in my uh, work experience, uh, you know, we're doing a lot of consulting for organizations and try to help them to become more beautiful organizations. And what I do a lot at the moment is to create kind of like safe spaces, I would call it, you know, to talk about those ambiguities in organizations because, you know, strategy is a lot focused more oftentimes on profit, yeah, then you have the legislation kicking in, then you also have your personal values kicking in in terms of what do I want to tell to my kids and so on. So it feels that that organizations need a lot of space to talk about those ambiguities when, when it comes to strategy. It felt a lot simpler uh, in earlier times. Are there any ambiguities in your company where you feel we have discussions around? Not too much. I think we're we're a pretty small company at this point, and I think fortunately because of that, most of the people in the organization have very similar kind of beliefs, and and we're have a similar I think mission. Um, you know, there's uh, I do think as the company grows and as I look to move into other parts, you know, like ultimately because you know right now our our sole factory is just outside of San Francisco. Um, 
but I can't offer it's it's the you know the most exp probably one of the most expensive markets in the United States, if not you know at least one of the top ten in the world. And so for us to continue to have you know um, real estate and labor all headquartered here, it's going to be challenging for us, I think you know long term. So you know we're looking at you know do, putting you know production facilities in other parts of the US and again and eventually you know globally. And as I think that, as we open more micro factories, as we hire people, you know, more people, hire people in, in different geographies, I do think that eventually, you know, we will have a broader difference in opinions, which, you know, to your point, I believe, I'm a firm believer that you should have safe space. Um, I don't think, if we all think the same, then we will never make change. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's really healthy for us to have debates and, and to have differences but to do it in a respectful manner. And so my only, even when I tell my teams, when we're, when we have differences of opinions, like you can have it out all day long. We can have these discussions. I'll create those spaces for us to do that as long as it's done respectfully. And the minute that it's not done respectfully, that's when I have, you know, and it doesn't mean that you, you can't have strong differences of opinions and you can't, you know, you can hold your ground but the minute that you do it where you start doing it in a way that I find is, is just not healthy, then, you know, I, I will you know, shut those conversations down. But but I do I do encourage that. And I want to make sure that, you know, as we grow, because that's only that's my in my opinion, the only way that you can actually move forward, um, because, you know, sometimes there's people that educate me on things that you know I thought I was really always right. And then you hear a different point of view and you're like, wow, OK, well, let me do some research on that and, and sometimes find out that you actually, you know, maybe we're misinformed to some degree. So. so what is it that you maybe in 10 years want to tell them uh, how you contributed kind of like business-wise also to a better world? What legacy do you want to leave here? Um, you know, my, my kids are very curious. You know, I've always encouraged them to ask a lot of questions to, um, you know, to kind of Sometimes it's challenging for me when they ask questions or challenge even me, but I understand and I appreciate it. Yesterday, perfect example and perfect timing. Yesterday, my son and I, um, we were in downtown San Francisco and there was a protest um, about against, a, there was a, a, a large corporation who had their headquarters um, in downtown San Francisco and there was a, there was a protest about fossil fuels. And my son asked me, like, what are fossil fuels and like, what are they, like, what are they protesting? What are they against? And I said, well, you know, I said, I could only read quickly read their signs and, and some of the things that they were saying. And so I started having, you know, and it, we, we started having a conversation about that. And I think what I want to make sure is that I, what I, whatever I leave my kids with is that they're, that they are inquisitive, that they understand, you know, that, um, we need to, you know, consume less, do better. I think as as um, as corporate citizens, as humans, and and things like that, and that they're always thinking and asking questions. And you know, even yesterday, my son was doing. Uh, he was he's been doing a lot of studying on Egyptians and Egyptian you know, history and culture. And he said to me, I said, well, I said, I think maybe it's time to move on. I said, you want to like talk maybe about like other, you know, look at other things like like what was happening in ancient Greece or the Romans. And he said, he's like, actually, I want to understand what the Romans point of view because the Romans and the Egyptians differed. He's like, so I really want to understand what that counter point of view. And to me, like, I was like, well, that's awesome. That's really amazing that you want to understand that you know, you, you see one point of view, but you also want to understand what else is somebody else's point of view. And I really hope that that's what I can kind of instill you know, I think in, in what we're doing is that, you know, we're challenging conventional norms and that there's always, you know, another way to do something. That sounds great. That sounds great. But if they are the curious uh, and if they will ask you when they are 20, you know, if they will ask you the question, Papa, what actually did you do for a better world? Uh, what will be your answer then? Um, I think I'm going to tell them that, you know, I mean, I, I, I saw, an, I saw a problem. Um, which I, I think that there's a huge problem in the furniture, you know, manufacturing space. Um, and we tried to make a difference. We, you know, we were trying to use in different materials. We were trying to um, think about, you know, how we manufacture, uh, you know, doing you know, more local manufacturing, using more sustainable, non-toxic materials, 
you know, that, that we saw a problem and we were trying to, you know, to solve that and also to change, make change, right? It's not just like we're small. And even if we do things differently, unless if the whole industry starts to move in a different direction, I alone will not be able to make, you know, I think that change. I think it really requires others to do it. And, and you know, I think I want to let them know that, you know, uh, when I see a problem, you know, that I, I've historically been able to try to solve those problems. I can't solve all of them, but, you know, I think we'll do everything that we can um, uh, to, to try to make a difference. Mm -hmm.